911, what are you reporting? Uh, I got a strange going on out here. Something just killed my dog. Something killed your dog? My dog went flying through the air over the tree. I don't know how it did it. Okay. Damn it, I'm really confused. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence, and he was dead when she hit the ground. I didn't see any cars. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence. What are you reporting? Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? It was. It was standing up. I'm out here looking through the window now and I don't see anything. I don't want to go outside. Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya! Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Hey, Brian, and thanks so much for having me on here. Absolutely, man. It's my pleasure. I know we tried to do this last year, and it just never happened, so I'm glad you're here. So let's get into it. Let's talk about this Bigfoot thing. Let's tell everybody a little bit about you and what got you interested in the subject to begin with. Yeah, so uh, I've been interested uh, from a, a very young age. Um, I was probably 11 or 12 when um, one, one night uh, watching Animal Planet, I stumbled across uh, Finding Bigfoot, and that kind of got me hooked on the subject. Um, and uh, yeah, I grew up, uh, I guess, uh, you know, not just uh, watching watching that that show uh, whenever I could, but uh, I would, you know, research uh, the Sasquatch subject all the time. And I would go out in the woods, um, you know, during my summers uh, up north. We, we have a, a cottage up north. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'd go out all the time uh, whenever I could. And I, I've just always been super interested in the subject. And then when I uh, started at university, I founded the Trent University Sasquatch Society. And um, now we have over uh, 200 students um, that are a part of the society. So it's been uh, pretty cool. What do you guys do is the Trent University Sasquatch Society, do you guys actually go out in the woods and look for these things? Yeah, yeah, we do that. Um, and then one of the other uh, big things we do is we speak with a lot of researchers and uh, try to take a lot of reports. So um, that's also uh, a huge area of focus for us. We, we get out in the, the field, uh, you know, go out in the woods uh, whenever we can. But, um, you know, kind of the overall goal for us is uh, Sasquatch education in the academic setting. That's awesome. So you guys have been out there. Have you had any experiences or any of you guys had experiences while you've been out in the woods? We, we've had a few students uh, say they've had some experiences. And then um, what is it? One of our executives actually was telling about something that happened uh, the other night. I think I think he heard some. What is it? Unique splash. Or so, I know I'm kind of forgetting now, actually, but he thought something was in the water, maybe maybe following him which uh, I found uh, pretty interesting. And then we've had a few other things that students have said they've uh, heard and seen. Um, so uh, it's, it's cool that, you know, students are getting out and, uh, you know, maybe having some activity. So I'm just glad that uh, people at the university are, are taking a real interest in the, the society. You were talking a little bit before we get started here on air about some of the howls and some of the things you've experienced. Can you talk a little bit about that and what that sounded like? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, like I mentioned, uh, over the years, I, I just try to get out in the woods when I can and, you know, just do kind of the basic uh, tree knocks, different things like that. Um, and yeah, I've heard uh, a few interesting howls myself that, uh, you know, I couldn't really explain, didn't sound like other animals that I've uh, become pretty familiar with, uh, you know, living uh, up north there in northern Ontario uh, during my, my summers. And uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, kind of jump the gun and, and uh, attribute them to Sasquatch, but I definitely say that they weren't, uh, you know, wolves or other animals that, that uh, you know, make howls and such things uh, out there that, you know, I've heard before. So, um, yeah, it's uh, definitely something I, I want to keep going back out to uh, those areas and, and checking in on and seeing if I can uh, figure out exactly what, what it was. Some of the vocalization stuff has really intrigued me. We've heard vocalizations here. I'm in North Carolina, so we've heard things on the property here that I can't explain. And I've had a couple of interviews just recently 
And both cases, I think one was in New Hampshire and the other one was here in North Carolina in a different part of the state than I'm in. And they both heard howls, which were very similar to what I heard. And they're heard in the Pacific Northwest and Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, middle of the country and Texas and the South. And those howls and those vocalizations, along with the footprints and things like that that people find in the woods, are usually the most common type of encounters that I document on this show. A lot of eyewitness encounters as well, but not very many people get to see these things. So in addition to some of the vocalizations and things like that, are you guys getting reports of or even finding like tree structures or these X formations and fulcrum type formations that other people are seeing. And I'm actually seeing here on my property in North Carolina. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, we get a lot of that uh, coming in and um, especially tree structures. And, you know, me personally, um, I don't think you can always uh, go and attribute uh, a tree structure to, to a Sasquatch, uh, you know, being the, the thing that had made it immediately, but they're, they're they are very intriguing. Uh, but yeah, we get a, a lot of reports of those and uh, some of the other types of evidence you mentioned all the time. So now we're at the point where you're hosting a new television show. So why don't you tell us about how that came about and then what people can expect when they tune into the show? Yeah, uh, it was pretty cool. I guess we kind of got uh, contacted by some uh, media group kind of in the town our university's in and uh they, they kind of said, oh, you know, we thought, because uh, last year we had some news coverage and stuff. We said, oh, it'd be cool if we maybe tried doing something with this. And, uh, you know, we said, sure. And then um, it, it, uh, the, the product they made actually kind of, it didn't turn out very well. And they, they were kind of like, okay, uh, why, why don't you guys um, try, you know, reaching out to every uh, network, everything you can try to sell it essentially. And, you know, typically, um, it, like in this sort of thing, it's supposed to be a production company's job. And, you know, they're kind of they're not a, really a production company, but they, you know, that, that was essentially more their role. But, you know, we tried and then we actually had, um, what is it, Wild TV, the network uh, we're now doing the show with, um, interested. And, uh, yeah, so we, we kind of realized, uh, oh, we can actually, you know, make all of this uh, ourselves and not, you know, the the... What, what they made wasn't, uh, <laughs> it was kind of funny, but it was, uh, it wasn't too, too, uh, too good, but, <laughs> but we still had, uh, this network interested that we, um, you know, had contacted. And, uh, so we put together a pilot for them and they, they really liked it. And, uh, yeah, we signed the deal, um, maybe uh, a month ago or so. And, uh, yeah, so the show's coming this fall and, uh, we're, we're really excited about it. What type of stuff are you going to be doing on the show? Is it a like a field-based investigation thing? Are you guys going to be following up on eyewitness encounters and other things? What What is that going to look like as far as the flow of the show and what people can expect when they tune in? Yeah, we'll be doing exactly those things uh, you mentioned there. Uh, yeah, so so what we've been doing a lot is um, you know we get uh, we get some some news coverage and whatnot with uh, the society and, and now the show. And we we try to use that to uh, to get witnesses um, you know aware of us in that they can uh, contact us if they've had something going on. So um, I hope uh, even people watching uh, watching your show after uh, we're done recording this, uh, you know, know if they've uh, had something in uh, Ontario or wherever. We still want to hear about it, but um, yeah, and, uh, and know to contact us and and you know we want to go follow up on those reports on the show and. Uh, just uh, see see who we can find out in these hot spots of uh, of Ontario where people keep saying they're uh, seeing things. Let's talk a little bit about the evidence that's already out there. I know you've you've looked into this. You obviously have your own society. You're now hosting this television show. What do you make of some of the evidence? Or in my case, I've had this thing recently where since the beginning of the year, it's been the lack of evidence for me because you know 1967 we had the PG film and it sort of. I've done interviews recently on other shows where Pat, one of the guys, the host of the show, put it into perspective for me and said, you know, the PG film basically put us on the five yard line and we've been there ever since. Now, I think we're a little farther down the road than that. I think there's quite a bit of evidence out there, foot castings, footprints, and even maybe some hair and DNA or eDNA kind of stuff. Right. But in general, I think we're probably on maybe the 15 or 20 yard line if we're using a football, American football analogy. 
have you seen any evidence that's really convinced you maybe outside of the Patterson Gimlin film or for me most recently, I don't know if you're familiar with the Paul Freeman footage or not from the late nineties, but you know, when I had Michael, his son on who just completed his book recently, the Freeman files, they sent me the enhanced version that Doug Highcheck did of this video and I've seen it. And it's amazing to me because it looks like this thing's picking up a baby off of a, tree and putting it on its waist and these little feet are dangling and it looks like a baby sasquatch to me so i was on the fence about the freeman footage really before i saw doug's enhanced version of that and i know cliff brackman cliff from finding bigfoot's coming on the show here in a couple of weeks and i'm going to talk about that with cliff because he's also worked on enhancing this footage right so I'm, i can't wait to hear what cliff's thinking about what he's got but i said all that to say is there anything that stuck out to you maybe over the last five or 10 years in Bigfoot as far as maybe video or other evidence that would convince you beyond a reasonable doubt? And maybe you're not even there yet because I'm most days I'm not there yet. Are you there beyond a reasonable doubt that these things exist? And if so, what has seen, what have you seen as far as evidence that has convinced you of that thus far? Yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, obviously over at the society, we, uh, we go through, uh, you know all the all the different footage out there we can find and uh, you know like the ones you mentioned and um yeah i mean obviously uh, the the patterson gimlin footage is obviously uh, the the holy grail kind of 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 what we have but but since then um yeah like you said the freeman footage and there's you know obviously a ton of other footage out there and footprints evidence and but um for me i think it's uh you know the overwhelming amount of reports that come in uh you know, not not just uh, with us, I mean, like, you know, everywhere, every Bigfoot research group, and there's so many people out there that are kind of putting their livelihoods and their jobs on the line coming out and saying that they, they've they seen something. And, you know, they're kind of at risk of being uh, seen as, as crazy or, or being ridiculed by, uh, you know, colleagues and, and friends and the, their communities. And so um, that, that for me is a pretty interesting moment when people kind of, you know, go out and do that and take take a, a big risk to say uh you know what they've seen and that kind of leaves me wondering you know how many people have seen something and we don't know about it because of all this stigma and you know we hope um getting this this research uh taken more seriously within universities um like ours that you know that stigma starts to to go away more and uh you know i think that'll come with time but um i think uh you know we won't know for certain or have it be accepted by science until unfortunately there there is a, a body in a lab somewhere i think i think that's just uh you know how mainstream science is and, and they won't uh, take it uh you know fully seriously or uh you know acknowledge it the the way uh you know i think we all feel that it should be until uh, until that time comes but uh yeah so i think that's probably what what would uh, need to happen to uh to know for sure and have it be accepted by a scientific community you mentioned it earlier on in the interview, and I want to touch base on that just a little bit about your wanting to get it more widely accepted in the scientific community. I think that's one of the things that just across the board, pretty much everybody that's involved in this is wanting to do on some level, right? Everybody is trying to push the scientific community to get involved. I guess it's sort of a two part question I'll ask you. A, why do you think it is that they don't take it more seriously? Because they've looked for novel species before. They've looked for cryptids have become reality in the past with different things like the thylacine and other animals that we could talk about. It's not a widely accepted thing, but it has been done, right? So I guess the two-part question would be for you, why do you think it is we are where we are with the scientific community in general with Bigfoot? Because I would argue that there are tons and tons of anecdotal accounts. There are foot castings, there's videos, there's pictures. We have a lot of circumstantial evidence, right? But for the most part, outside of, you know, John Bendernagel, Jeff Meldrum, and a few other people in the scientific community that are taking a look at this, there's very little interest from the scientific community that I've seen. So, a, why do you think it is that that is the case with Bigfoot, with all this mountain of what people would purport to be evidence? And I guess the second part of that question is, what is your plan or how do you see what you you guys are doing and maybe even your show pushing that forward and maybe making that more of a reality? Yeah, we have a, a few different ways we uh, we hope to address all that. But, uh, 
you know, I think I think that's a, a interesting comparison you make to the uh, to the thylacine, and you know, I think the difference there is, uh, you know, if, if you look at, at that uh, species, which I guess now would be a uh, you know considered a cryptid since um, you know they've been uh, labeled as extinct and, and no longer uh, exist in the eyes of science. Um, you know, it was obviously very well documented uh, until. I think uh, the thylacine went extinct in, in uh, the 30s, right? Yeah. And uh, I, I think that's treated a little bit differently by science because it was uh, obviously, you know, they had these things in zoos and uh, they had bodies and, and, you know, were completely aware that these things lived out there. And then with, uh, you know, Sasquatch, for example, I'd say the, what is it? I guess the Gigantopithecus is really the last sort of... Uh, body we have of something that uh, could be classified as a, a Sasquatch species, really. So I think that's kind of the difference when uh, those two things are, are looked at and examined by scientists. Because I, uh, you know, I've, I've done a, a fair bit of reading on the thylacine, actually, and I'm pretty uh, interested in it. Um, and there are very remote places in Australia where people keep saying they see these things. And so I think it's, it is possible that they, they might still uh, be out there and still exist in, in Australia. And I believe, uh, what is it, New Guinea too, uh, is, is a, a place that, I don't know, I watched a, a Forrest Galante interview uh, where he was talking about wanting to go there and, and check it out because some of the remote uh, areas, which I, I found super interesting. But um, yeah, we, we hope to, uh, to, in our show though, um, yeah, just, just really, I guess make people aware that it's it's okay to to talk about this stuff and and try to to set a real example and uh, try to bring more I guess academics and scientists into the mix and have them on the show uh, to you know kind of to show people that you know there really is something here worth worth looking into and that a lot of great scientists and you know PhDs uh, are are taking the time to uh, to look into so I think that's uh, you know, really important for kind of ending the stigma around all this and, and something, um, you know, we, we hope to, to show people. I definitely agree. That's what I try to do here on the show. I try to have as many academics on. I've had Meldrum on and I've got, uh, who have I got coming up? I've got uh, Dr. Sarmiento who's coming on here in the next couple of weeks. And there's a lot of people that are taking a look at this. That was one of the things that Meldrum and I talked about when I had him on the show was the younger generation like yourself of scientists that are coming up, whether it's citizen scientists or trained scientists that are going through the, the colleges now that are interested in the subject. And that's one of the things that was very enlightening for me because I wasn't aware of that. So Meldrum getting to see that firsthand in his students was really something that I was glad to see and I'm very proud of. And hopefully that will continue throughout history. And I think, you know, once the old guard, and that's one of the things Meldrum said when he was on the show, you know, people like him have to die, unfortunately, for the next generation to come up and say, let's take this seriously. Let's, let's really take a look at it. So I guess one of the things that I've asked people recently is I don't I don't like to get into the question of what these things are, because I don't even think that's really relative at this point. I don't think it's something that we should even be talking about because it's not a proven species. Let's wait until we prove it and then get there. But I'll ask you this before we close out. This is something that's been on my mind. We talked about the evidence and, and the mountain of anecdotal stuff that's out there. Why is it that you think in 2023, we're still on the 10 or 15 yard line with this ball. Why do you think there isn't more proof and acceptance that these things are real? And I, I don't think you ever answered the question. So I'll throw that on the end. Are you 100% convinced that these things are real? Or are you still trying to figure that out for yourself? Uh, I'd say over at the society and, and myself, uh, you know, we are trying to figure that out still uh, for certain. Because, uh, you know, like I said, I think uh, you do need a, a body to to be sure, uh, unfortunately. But, um, you know, me personally, I'm probably, you know, somewhere between 90 and 100 percent. But I do leave some some room there because, uh, you know, I've never seen one of these things. And, uh, you know, we don't have a body. Uh, we don't have conclusive uh, DNA evidence. I mean, a lot of people, uh, you know, say that there is conclusive DNA evidence, but um, a lot of the, you know, scientist uh, I've spoken to, uh, you know, say, say that there isn't conclusive uh, evidence on that yet. So um, 
I think those are, are two of the things that, that really need to change to, uh, to get past the, uh, what is it, five or, uh, or 20 yard line and, you know, really, uh, really know for sure. I definitely agree. So I know you guys are working on the show now and it's going to be out this fall. So we'll probably have to have you back when you put your first couple of episodes out. I'd love to talk to you and kind of catch up and see how the show's going. But in the meantime, when it's going to be available, where can people find it? What's the best way to reach out to you guys if there is something that they want to report to you guys and maybe have you come and take a look at it? So where can they find the show and how's the best way for them to reach you? Yeah, the best way for them to reach us is uh, through our website, sasquatchuniversity.com. And uh, the show won't air until uh, I believe the first episode airs September 25th, 2023. So um, yeah, just to, to get uh, Wild TV, I think if you just go to their website, it says how to get them through your providers and whatnot. But uh, yeah, that's the, the best way to, to watch uh, the show and then uh, to contact us also. If, uh, you know, you've seen anything or have something you, you think we should know. So, um, yeah, we, we uh, really appreciate it when uh, people get in touch and, uh, you know, have something to share with us. I will link to all that in the show notes. You guys go over and check out SasquatchUniversity.com and make sure you tune into the show on Wild TV when it comes out. Ryan, I really appreciate you coming on and telling us about your project, man. I've had a blast talking to you. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, having me on. and. Um, you know, one thing I forgot to mention that uh, we kind of came up with just over the past weekend uh, to help uh, not just fund the show, but also give back to the Sasquatch uh, research community. Um, we have. They say you're.